An independent and truly global United Kingdom, the government formally sets out its strategy for leaving the European Union. The Brexit Secretary, David Davis, says the UK will approach talks with the EU in a spirit of goodwill and wants the EU to be a political and economic success. Whatever the outcome of our negotiations, we seek a more open, outward-looking, confident and fairer UK that works for everyone. We'll be live from Westminster also this lunchtime. The Bank of England forecasts better growth for the UK economy over the next three years, but warns higher inflation could hit households. A controversial human rights lawyer has been struck off for acting dishonestly in bringing abuse claims against British soldiers in Iraq. Allegations John Smythe, a former colleague of the Archbishop of Canterbury, physically abused teenage boys at a church holiday camp in the 70s. I obviously didn't know that he was um, abusing people in any way at all. Carly Lovett, the 24-year-old, shot dead during the Tunisian beach terror attack. An inquest hears how her fiancé tried to save her life. And the worst by far, how Donald Trump reportedly described his phone call with the Australian Prime Minister. In the south, a police investigation following allegations of abuse involving former pupils of Winchester College and working into retirement, the GPs keeping things going amid a crisis in recruitment. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. In the last few minutes, the government has been giving details of its strategy for leaving the European Union. In its white paper, it says the UK wants a bold and ambitious free trade agreement with Europe and other countries around the world. The Brexit Secretary, David Davis, told MPs that the UK's best days were to come. But Labour's shadow Brexit Secretary, Keir Starmer, said the white paper contained nothing. Here's our political correspondent, Eleanor Garnier. We're on our way out. That much is clear. But what will life outside the EU look like? The Prime Minister's long asked for plan finally presented to Parliament. Secretary David Davis. The Brexit Secretary outlined the details of the White Paper. It confirms the Prime Minister's vision of an independent, truly global UK and an ambitious future relationship with the European Union. Controlling our own laws and ensuring a smooth, orderly Brexit, just part of a series of priorities for the government. These 12 objectives amount to one goal, a new, positive and constructive partnership between Britain and the European Union that works in our mutual interest. In front of ministers and diplomats last month, the Prime Minister spelt out her plan, a clue to the contents of her white paper. What I am proposing cannot mean membership of the single market. So out of the special club that allows free movement of goods, services, capital and people. Instead, into a new trade deal, aiming for access without barriers or tariffs and, crucially, getting control of migration. MPs hope all this detail means they can now properly scrutinise the government's plans, especially as after last night's vote, it seems we've now passed the point of no return. It was an historic moment. So the eyes have it. But with dozens of Labour MPs voting against, it's left the opposition in disarray once again. Several sacrificed their front bench jobs rather than obey Jeremy Corbyn's orders to vote for the bill. Not Diane Abbott, though, the shadow Home Secretary, close ally of Mr Corbyn and staunch Remain campaigner. So of course the government has... Well enough to debate just three hours before the vote, then struck by illness that apparently kept her away from the Commons. Is Brexit splitting Labour, Mr Corbyn? What now for the party leader facing his fourth reshuffle in 18 months? Is the Labour Party facing another crisis, would you say, Mr Corbyn? Even the party's most faithful admit Brexit is more than a headache. It's an enormous issue in terms of its importance to the country, and that's going to be reflected in all the debates uh, in Parliament. There are differences of view uh, within our party, and clearly they were very manifest yesterday, but there are deep divisions uh, within the Conservative Party too. Divisions aside, the Prime Minister has drawn up her plans. Now she has to persuade a continent that what she wants is possible. Eleanor Garnier, BBC News, Westminster. 
And we can speak to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, who is at Westminster. A big moment in Parliament. Is that it now? No going back? Is Brexit unstoppable? Well, I'd hesitate to say unstoppable, Sophie, because we've still got two years to go. Who knows what will happen in Brussels? And as Harold Macmillan used to say, events, dear boy, events can change everything. But here, for now, Theresa May is very much in the Brexit driving seat. And you're slightly scratching your head as to why she fought tooth and nail not to allow MPs a vote and it had to be dragged out of her by the Supreme Court because last night's vote has hugely strengthened her position because she can now say not only does she have the mandate of the British people from the referendum, but she also has the mandate from the House of Commons. So the expectation is she will be able to press ahead with her plan. Here it is, 75 pages, doesn't tell us uh, much new. It's got some nice shiny graphs in it. The only interesting thing in it is we learned there will be a separate bill on immigration to introduce the restrictions to freedom of movement which are central to her strategy for Brexit and which are almost certain to cause Labour more grief. And there we see a Labour Party which is desperately trying to hold itself together after more than 40 Labour MPs defied Mr Corbyn last night and crucially speculation about the conduct of Diane Abbott, one of Jeremy Corbyn's closest political allies who didn't take part in the vote because she had a migraine. Have to say a lot of sceptical eyebrows being raised and people wondering whether Maybe she just threw a sickie because she couldn't stomach voting for Brexit. And if that is the case, that would suggest the divisions within Labour go from the parliamentary party through the shadow cabinet right into Jeremy Corbyn's inner circle. Norman Smith in Westminster, thank you. The Bank of England has been painting a rosier picture of the economy in its latest forecast. It's raised its growth forecasts for the next three years, defying fears last year of an imminent Brexit slowdown. Interest rates have also been kept on hold at 0.25%, but there are warnings that consumer spending could still slow down as inflation rises rapidly. Well, Simon Gompertz has been listening to what the bank had to say. He's with me now. Growth, first of all, it is a lot higher, or forecast to be a lot higher than it was being even a year, less than a year ago. It is, and this is the, the bank's look every three months at how well the economy is doing. So it is very important also in guiding the bank's policy. Um, and it adds to this picture, people have askew accused it of being excessively grim about the prospects for the economy after the Brexit vote. So in August last year, after the vote, it said economic growth this year, in 2017, would be only 0.8%, which was a big fall. Then in November, it revised that up to 1.4%. Now, um, the bank is saying it's going to be 2% this year. So a big change, and it's meant accusations that they have been too pessimistic. Those came up again today in the, the press conference after this was published, where the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, was asked what went wrong. I think the thing that uh, we missed um, is uh, the strength of consumer spending um, and uh, consumer confidence associated with that, uh, that was present, has been present all the way through uh, this process. So uh, after an initial wobble in terms of consumer surveys, uh, confidence surveys and other uh, initial indicators in the immediate aftermath of the referendum uh, in the depths of the summer, uh, it bounced back pretty quickly. And he added that world growth had been better and that the government's squeeze on spending had been relaxed slightly in the autumn. But there was a warning in there, and that is about inflation and the impact it could have on many, many households. What hasn't changed is that the pound has remained low after falling after the Brexit vote, so it's almost 20% down against other currencies. That meant, means other things are more expensive that we import from the rest of the world. It means inflation, prices going up, and the banks maintains its view uh, that next year inflation will rise to around 2.8%. And economists uh, out there think it could be even, even worse than that. So that main, remains a big warning from the Bank of England. Simon Gompertz, thank you. A controversial human rights lawyer who took up the cases of thousands of Iraqis who alleged they'd been abused by British soldiers during the Iraq conflict has been struck off. Phil Shiner was found to have acted dishonestly in bringing murder and torture claims against the soldiers. Caroline Hawley has the story. Phil Shiner was once regarded as one of this country's best human rights lawyers. But his firm has had to close, his reputation is in shreds, and he'll now never work as a lawyer again. It was from the aftermath of the Iraq war that Phil Shiner rose to public prominence. 
suing the British Army over allegations of abuse defined his career and became a personal crusade. In all, he's brought more than 2,000 claims. I don't know whether people were killed, but I think something went wrong. We need to find out who was responsible and who in command knew what on earth was going on here. They were kept naked, they were sexually humiliated. This is Baha Musa, an Iraqi hotel worker battered to death in British custody. This footage shows just the start of his ordeal. It was Phil Shiner who brought the case through the British courts and to a public inquiry. But it was another public inquiry that was to prove his undoing. The Al Swadi inquiry examined what happened after a ferocious battle in southern Iraq in 2004. These are the bodies of insurgents killed on the battlefield, but a number of Iraqis represented by Phil Shiner with legal aid had claimed they'd been murdered and mutilated in British custody. Those claims were found to be based on lies and speculation, and Phil Shiner's work was suddenly under scrutiny. In December, he confessed to paying an agent to find clients. He admitted to acting without integrity. He did not admit to trying to cover his tracks. The false allegations had put immense stress on the soldiers involved. Really, their marriages have been affected, their lives have been affected. The anguish this has caused them is, is quite shocking. And also, they're reliving situations in wartime which they'd rather forget. Many of them have been, um, they've left the service 15, 20 years ago. He's now been exposed for so many false allegations. He's made soldiers' lives a misery over the last uh, few years. I think the decent thing now would be for him to apologise properly to all those troops and their families. For Mr Shiner's firm too, it was a lucrative business, the tribunal was told. It heard that he'd ignored the rules of his profession, believing that his work was so important that the ends justified the means. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, says he wasn't aware of allegations of physical abuse made against a former colleague. It's alleged that in the 1970s and early 80s, a barrister, John Smythe, physically abused young boys at a Christian summer camp where the Archbishop was also working. The Church of England has admitted it failed terribly by not reporting the allegations to the police sooner. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Tom Simons. The accusation is that John Smythe, a barrister and leader of the Christian camps, groomed boys and beat them severely, giving the explanation that this would purge them of their sins. Some were schoolboys at Winchester College. They described being so severely injured it was difficult to sit down. The college says it knew nothing about what was going on. Another young future church leader also worked at the camps, knew John Smythe. But the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, insisted today he knew nothing about the beatings. I was 19, 20 years old. I was a junior leader in a camp. Uh, these were the senior leaders. I wasn't part of the inner circle. It's alleged the abuse started in 1978, when public school boys and students were invited to the summer camps. In 1982, it's claimed John Smythe was advised to move abroad. The beatings had come to light. One of the alleged victims had tried to kill himself. The Archbishop was made aware in 2013, and the Church has now made a full apology. There's so many places where our society thought that it was OK to cover up the most terrible treatment of children and vulnerable adults. And I don't know how many more cases there will be, but on each one, it will be, nothing will be covered up. In your religious life, have you ever seen any evidence of beating going on? No, never. Last year, an Anglican bishop, Peter Ball, became the first to be jailed for child sexual abuse. Again, the church had to apologize. There's a pattern here, the allegation of children harmed by respected church figures the claims of a cover-up, the belated attempts by Lambeth Palace to work out what's gone wrong. It's a pattern that is being investigated by the public inquiry into child abuse. This case may provide more evidence. Tom Simons, BBC News at Lambeth Palace. The inquests into the deaths of 30 British tourists who were killed in a terror attack at a beach resort in Tunisia in 2015 have been hearing about the death of a 24-year-old woman who was on holiday with her fiancé. Carly Lovett ran into the hotel in Seuss with her partner when the firing began. Richard Galpin reports. 
Carly Lovitz, who was 24 years old, had recently got engaged to her long-term boyfriend, Liam Moore. The trip to Tunisia was their first holiday alone. But just a few weeks later, Liam and her family, relatives and friends were mourning her death at a funeral in Lincolnshire. She and Liam had been caught up in the attack at an upmarket hotel in Tunisia two years ago. The gunman Saifuddin Rezgi specifically targeting British holidaymakers in the name of so-called Islamic State. He was armed with an assault rifle and explosives. Today, the inquest heard how Carly and Liam had hidden on the first floor of the hotel after realising the resort was under attack. But the gunman, after killing many people outside, then moved into the main building, shooting dead more holidaymakers and eventually reaching Carly and Liam. She was shot in the chest and hit by shrapnel, probably from a grenade. In his evidence, Liam Moore said he saw Carly lying on the floor in a pool of blood. He could tell she was fading. She said to him, I love you, and he told her, I love you. He then decided to try and save her life by doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But then he said when he felt her body relax, he knew it hadn't worked. Carly's parents described her as a perfect child. She was a photographer, designer and had a successful fashion blog. Her mother said, I cannot find the words to express how much she is missed. Richard Galpin, BBC News, at the Royal Courts of Justice. The time is just after quarter past one, our top story this lunchtime. The government has been outlining its strategy for leaving the European Union. The Brexit Secretary David Davis said the UK's best days were to come. And still to come, on the eve of the Six Nations on Saturday is rugby in the lower division struggling to keep up with the elite game. And coming up in South today, working into retirement, the GPs keeping things going amid a crisis in recruitment. And 20 years of crash testing in Berkshire. A look at how car safety has improved. The worst by far of his phone calls with world leaders. That's what Donald Trump reportedly said of his telephone conversation with the Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. It's understood they had an angry exchange over a deal signed by President Obama to send illegal immigrants from Australia to America for resettlement. Donald Trump tweeted later that it was a dumb deal and he'd be looking at it carefully. The Australian Prime Minister admitted the call had been very frank and forthright but denied reports that the president had hung up on him. Here's our world affairs correspondent, Paul Adams. America's combative new president appears to have picked yet another fight. The fallout from last week's executive order on refugees now casting a shadow over one of Washington's closest relationships. Last year, the Obama administration agreed to take in up to 1,250 asylum seekers from Australia's controversial offshore processing camps in the Pacific. But many are from countries whose citizens are now temporarily barred from entering the United States. On Saturday, when Australia's Prime Minister sought assurances the deal was still on track, the conversation was, according to the Washington Post, cut short. I've seen that report uh, and I'm not going to comment on the conversation other than to say that uh, in the course of the conversation, as you know and as was confirmed by the President's official spokesman uh, in the White House, uh, the President assured me that he would uh, continue with uh, honour the uh, agreement we entered into with the Obama administration. But late last night, a typically incendiary tweet from the President. Do you believe it, he said. The Obama administration agreed to take thousands of illegal immigrants from Australia. Why? I will study this dumb deal. The fate of the deal remains unclear, but it seems America's friends and foes are all having to get used to the new president's unique style of diplomacy. It's up to his senior officials to pursue rather more conventional approaches. His defence secretary, James Mattis, is in South Korea. His boss has frequently accused America's Asian allies of taking Washington's support for granted. But this trip and an agreement to deploy an American missile defence system suggest that in some quarters at least, it's business as usual. 
Not so with Iran. At the weekend, Tehran tested a medium-range ballistic missile. Now Mr Trump says Iran is formally on notice. Should have been thankful, he tweeted this morning, for the terrible deal the US made with them. It's not clear what he plans to do about the agreement, but the businessman turned president is looking at America's deals with the world and he doesn't like what he sees. Paul Adams, BBC News. Well, let's speak to our correspondent in Washington, Kim Hutters. And uh, as Paul just said, President Trump's unique style of diplomacy, it certainly underlines the uncharted waters we now find ourselves in. Yes, absolutely. Quite a combative approach to uh, foreign uh, policy and, and diplomacy. And it's not just uh, America's foes like Iran being put on notice, but clearly also some of America's allies, Australia, but also the U.S. media this morning reporting that a conversation with the Mexican president involved the president of the United States threatening to send the military across the border if Mexico did not clamp down on drug cartels. Now, the question being asked this morning in Washington is who is leaking the details of these conversations? Um, is it a career White House staffer stunned and dismayed by the tone that President Trump is using in those conversations? Or is it perhaps someone on his team who believes that the tone of these conversations shows that the president is in fact delivering on his campaign promise to shake things up? Remember, Donald Trump did say repeatedly during the campaign that he felt America was not getting its fair share in agreements with its allies, whether it's NATO or trade deals. But whoever is on the receiving end of these calls or tweets, it is unsettling. But remember, America is still the world's superpower. And for now, allies and foes will be treading carefully and try to downplay the tensions. Kim, thank you. An investigation into alleged misuse of parliamentary funds by the French presidential candidate François Fillon has been widened to include his children. The former prime minister is already accused of paying his wife for work she may not have done. He denies doing anything wrong, but fellow conservatives are urging him to abandon his campaign. Hundreds of thousands of Romanians have taken to the streets to demonstrate against government plans to downgrade some corruption offences. The proposals mean that public officials will be spared a jail sentence if they were involved in crimes amounting to less than £40,000. They're the biggest demonstrations in the country since the fall of communism. A 16-week public consultation on a third runway at Heathrow begins today. The government will be setting out the planning regulations and other measures with which the airport must comply. The Transport Secretary, Chris Grayling, said the expansion would benefit British business and new aircraft technology would lessen the impact of noise and air pollution. The social media site Facebook goes from strength to strength, it seems. Its profits are up more than 170% and it now has nearly 2 billion users. But it's also been ordered to pay damages worth nearly £400 million over claims it unlawfully used another firm's virtual reality technology. Well, let's speak to our technology correspondent, Rory Catherine jones £400 million, a lot of money, but probably won't dent Facebook's profits by the looks of it. Yes, Sophie, Facebook was almost able to brush off that sum because it had these stunning results to announce. Uh, its revenues were up 50% on a year. All of that money, or just about all of that money, coming from advertising on mobile phones, where it is now a hugely dominant force, uh, perhaps frighteningly dominant. I think regulators around the world will be looking at that and saying just how much power has Facebook got in that vital new industry. And it keeps on growing. We thought, uh, we've heard over the years, oh, Facebook one day is going to go out of fashion. People have predicted it time and time again. In the last year, it added its user, user numbers by 270 million. That's almost as many people as use as, uh, as, as Twitter's total uh, population, as it were. So no signs yet of problems. It, it forecast last year that things would be more difficult this year uh, for it, but no signs of that happening yet. Rory, thank you. Starting primary school is a big moment for children as well as for their parents, but a group of mums in Cornwall, what have for a group of mums in Cornwall, it's something more of a challenge because their children have Down syndrome. So they've written a book to help parents, children and schools to adapt to school life. And it's been so successful, it's spreading the message around the UK and beyond. John Maguire has the story. Now, shall we finish? We need to do some more. It's Noah's first year at his primary school in Cornwall. The children paint and play games as he might expect, but they're also learning Makaton a type of sign language. Wolf. Does anybody know the sign for wolf? It's to help them communicate with Noah, who has Down syndrome. Oh, 
It's amazing how the children sort of, they, ha they almost have this understanding that he, he is, he's slightly different to them, but he, they don't treat him differently. If anything, they're sort of very understanding. They want to help Noah and they all want to be friends with him. He's very popular in our class. In common with 6,500 children in Cornwall who've just started school, Noah and his classmates received a book as part of a starter pack. He's one of the children featured and his mum is one of those who devised the idea. This group all have children with Down syndrome, around 750 are born each year in the UK and this book is given to those parents. Their second book is designed for all children starting primary. The book, paid for by fundraising, is now spreading across the UK and around the world. What gives us goose pimples to know is that this little book that contains those little faces is going out to the little hands that it was made for and that's fantastic because what we hope is that when that little pack goes home, the treasure, star, treasure pack goes home with that child and they open the book with their grown up and they say something like, why has that child got hearing aids? What are those, why does that child sit in that chair? That the grown up might answer them and say, oh, he's got hearing aids because he needs those to, so he can hear. And that's what it's about, that, that, that opportunity for a small child to ask the question, to receive the answer and then move on to the next thing because that's what children do. This is one that Angie's made for all children going to school. Angie and Ted are meeting up with the actor and writer Sally Phillips and her son Ollie. Last year, Sally made a documentary looking at a new prenatal test that some believe could eradicate the condition. She's endorsing the book and believes it makes a difference. Yes, because we're afraid of things we don't know and things we don't recognize and different things, we all are. And, and so I think um, making little kids with Down syndrome familiar and unthreatening to two other children is a great thing. Back home, and Ted's main aim is to beat his sisters at snap, but for his mum and the other volunteers, their ambition is to help every child, whether with Downs or not, to take those first crucial steps into their brave new world. John Maguire, BBC News, Cornwall. The Six Nations gets underway on Saturday, with England beginning the defence of their title against France at Twickenham. Millions of people will watch the tournament, a sign of the huge success of the top-flight game. But the story in other parts of the domestic game isn't so rosy. Many clubs on the second rung of English rugby are struggling financially, as our sports correspondent Alex Capstick now reports. Nottingham, a proud rugby club and one of the oldest in the country, now playing in the Championship, the second tier of the English game, a division toiling for survival under the professional banner. Always looking at the figures every week, you know, to make sure that we can balance the books and ensure that we can pay the wages at the end of each month. You've got to really cut your cloth to meet, you know, your own costs, really. Um, and it is possible, but it's very, very hard work. Championship clubs get just over half a million pounds a year from the RFU, the world's richest rugby union, but it's not enough. With average attendances at some clubs in the hundreds, relying on wealthy benefactors is often the only solution. But when they walk away, the problem resurfaces. It's been a rocky journey for Nottingham in this division. A few years ago, a last minute rescue saved them from going out of business. And today's opponents, Jersey, were forced to sell their ground in order to retain championship status but not everyone has found shelter from the financial demands. Phillips, this is John Williams. Even a club with a history as rich as London Welsh couldn't be saved, thrown out of the league last week because they couldn't pay the bills. It was a decision taken by the RFU, which is under pressure to revamp the championship. They want unused academy players at premiership clubs to drop down a level, but handing out big sums of money is not an option. We do have to give it a little bit of love, we do have to give it some attention and it's not always about giving it more money. Everyone says give it more money. What more money will do potentially is actually raise the wage bills and raise the, the demands on the wages which again could be another problem. So with extra cash scarce, what about this for a more traditional alternative? These players at Richmond in southwest London train at night time because during the day they've got jobs. Financially stable, it's the only amateur club in the league and one that bounced back after getting burnt in the early days of professional rugby. And it's taken the club 18 years to get back to where it is now um, in a much more sustainable um, and I think a much more enjoyable model. And my experience has been that you know clubs that have gone professional at the top end 
very quickly lose touch with the rest of their club. Uh, and that's not what Richmond Rugby Club is about. Despite their often painful existence, others believe a professional game below elite level does have a viable future, but they need help soon. Alex Capstick, BBC News. Time for a look at the weather now with Phil Avery. Hello. Sophie, thanks very much indeed. Our satellite pictures are really good, aren't they? It looks very busy, and I know some of you like to see those. Others prefer our pressure patterns. Whichever way you look at it, yes, it is very busy. Big area of low pressure driving the weather at the moment over the western side of Ireland. A lot of isobars packed in, especially across the western side of the British Isles. You've seen the big picture. This is what it really looks like, Penzance Cornwall. That's one of our weather watchers earlier on today. Not alone, I have to say. Uh, those isobars really generating a lot of wind. Some of the gusts in the black uh, arrows here, 50, 60 miles an hour around about the coast, over the exposed ground, right up into Northern Ireland. It's been quite wet here, in fact, quite wet either side of the North Channel today. Uh, any weather elsewhere? Well, there are spirals of cloud throwing bands of rain at times further east, but there isn't very much in the way uh, of rain. Some of you could get away with a dry afternoon and a relatively mild one, 8 to 11 should cover it. Not a great deal changes through the evening and overnight. We have further pulses of rain spiralling around that uh, area of low pressure. Uh, but if your skies stay clear for any length of time, well, your temperatures may just dip below the sort of values I'm showing here for the towns and cities. So, what news for Friday? Friday gets off to a pretty wet start across the northwestern quarter of Scotland. Quite windy here as well. Elsewhere, it's a really decent morning. Has to be a butt, doesn't there? Uh, we're going to spin up this area of low pressure in the Western Channel. That will throw some pretty wet and windy weather ever further northwards and slightly eastwards during the course of the day. But many of you will get away with a pretty decent sort of day, despite all the chat we had about storms and all the rest of it. So where's that all gone? Well, it hasn't exactly gone away because later in the day, uh, Western Channel, the southwest of England, southern Wales, through the Channel area and eventually up into the southeast, that sort of strength of wind is distinctly possible. And all the while, we're pushing that rain ever further north, such that as I take you on into the start of the weekend, we suspect that that area of low pressure moves up to give one of those sort of days for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere again, really rather decent, although we may well see some rain across southern and southeastern counties uh, during the course of the day. But again, a great swathe uh, looking fairly settled fair there. And then comes Sunday. That low pressure might come close to the eastern side of Scotland. If it does, that'll be really quite wet and windy. It might stay out in the North Sea. And that just makes room for another little disturbance to come into the Southern Channel area. Again, so a wee bit breezy here, a little bit of rain. But again, many of you, a lot of dry weather. So there's quite a lot going on. If you want it at your pace, it's there for you uh, with all the details about the storms and the warnings at the BBC Weather website. Sophie. Thank you. A reminder of our main story this lunchtime. Another Brexit milestone as the government formally outlines its strategy for leaving the European Union. The Brexit secretary, David Davis, said the UK's best days were to come. And a controversial human rights lawyer has been struck off for acting dishonestly in bringing abuse claims against British soldiers in Iraq. That's all from the BBC News at One, so it's goodbye from me on BBC One. The news teams, where you are. Bye-bye.